It's 2024. Are you still shooting with a digital camera? It's time to return to analog. The problem is, buying a 35 millimeter camera is a lot like walking into a Taco Bell. You see a lot of options in front of you, but when it comes out the other end, it's all gonna look kind of the same. It's more about the mode of consumption. All right, maybe that was both a gross oversimplification and a gross oversimplification. So allow me to act as the nightlight to the proverbial toilet that is your first and or last 35 millimeter film camera. Before we begin, let's get a few things out of the way. This video is going to be covering 35 millimeter cameras only. I'm not gonna be covering medium format or any other larger formats. When you're starting out, you need a lot of room for failure. And if you're like me, when you're not starting out, you still need a lot of room for failure. When you shoot 120, you get far fewer shots per roll and therefore your per frame cost is a lot higher than with 35 millimeter. Not to mention the fact that the average medium format camera and its respective lenses tends to be much higher than that of 35 millimeter. If you're not sure you're gonna like it, there's really no reason to spend a significant amount of money from the get-go. In the world of analog photography, the most expensive pieces of gear are those that perform whatever function they serve the best or have a specific feature set that cannot be found on any other product. We can take the Leica M6 for example, which is expensive because it's the best at farming clout and flexing wealth. But don't let being broke stop you from shooting analog. I know I haven't. There's really no need to spend more than $100 on your first kit. And if you really want to save money, you can pretty easily spend less than 50. But if you want to spend more, there are plenty of other people on the internet that can point you in the right direction. What? Before we buy a camera though, we first need to understand what our options are. While it's true that technically the only things that are going to impact your final image are the film and the lens that you have attached to your camera, the type of camera that you decide to go with is going to affect how you shoot and therefore, to some degree, the things that you take photos of. Pretty much every 35 millimeter camera can be divided into five main categories, point and shoots, manual focus SLRs, autofocus SLRs, range finders, and toy cameras. The category we're gonna start with is point and shoots because it's going to eliminate the most people, so to speak. If all you're looking to do is have some fun burning your hard earned cash without putting too much thought into it, this is probably the category for you. Although there are more efficient ways of achieving that. So where to start on point and shoot cameras? Well, they take all the technical legwork out of analog photography, except for composition. So you can kind of adopt a sort of run and gun shooting style. They tend to be highly pocketable, although this is going to be dependent on whatever model you choose. But in general, they're good as take everywhere cameras. I personally keep one in the center console of my car because I like to stay strapped photographically. There are a lot of point and shoot naysayers out there, and I would know because I used to be one. But after using them a lot more, I came to realize that they can really be as serious of a photographic tool as you want them to be. Unfortunately, they're not without their limitations. It's kind of a double-edged sword that you're relying on the camera to make technical decisions for you because the camera will fail kind of a lot. The light meter will get thrown off by a high contrast scene, the camera will occasionally miss focus, and so on. But these are things that I'm already really good at. This is why I think that point and shoots are better for someone who's not as gung-ho on the technical side of analog photography. And for everyone else, just go in knowing that there are technical limitations that will translate into creative limitations. I find that point and shoot cameras tend to work better the smoother your brain is, in that the less effort you put into your shots, the better they seem to turn out. Although, maybe it's just me. The real factors to consider when buying one of these are the lens and whether or not the camera has any sort of manual input that will allow you to affect the exposure. In my experience, the fixed lens models will yield better image quality, have faster lenses, and tend to be a bit more compact. I personally think that the teleconverter models tend to be a bit overlooked as they give you the best of both worlds between sharpness and focal length coverage. As far as settings go, the models that afford you the most control 
are also going to be the most unaffordable. These higher-end Unicorn models like the Contax T2 and T3, Leica Mini Lux and Minolta TC1 are arguably the worst value in analog photography. One of the other major drawbacks of point-and-shoot cameras is that they have the highest rate of irreparable failure that I've seen in any of the categories that we'll be talking about today. They were never really designed to be repaired to begin with, and so by sinking money into an expensive one, you're taking the highest risk possible on a gear purchase. I would not recommend spending more than $30 on a point-and-shoot camera, and it's really not hard to avoid doing that. You can get a good value if you limit your expectations on what you're going to get for your money. Personally, I recommend most of the Canon models. They made a billion of these things, and a lot of the fixed lens versions were based on the same optical design, which is surprisingly good. Honestly though, I would just search eBay and sort by price. Literally anything with a fixed lens that's actually working is going to give you pretty similar results. Moving on, we have manual focus SLRs, which is our most abundant category of the day. And it can technically be divided into two subcategories, electromechanical SLRs and fully mechanical SLRs. Now the main difference between the two is that one requires a battery to fire the shutter and the other doesn't. While they both effectively do the same thing, you're usually going to get a lot more features out of an electromechanical SLR at the cost of having to carry an extra battery or two, which is somehow a deal breaker for a lot of people. Anyway, the benefit of shooting with an SLR is that the camera focuses through the lens, meaning that you're able to frame and compose as precisely as possible. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is a very vast category, meaning that feature sets will vary from camera to camera with differing degrees of manual control and automation. To give you some baseline guidance, I would avoid buying anything that doesn't allow you to shoot fully manually. What you want is a camera with a minimum top shutter speed of 1 500th of a second, a hot shoe, built-in light meter, and interchangeable lenses. A few aspects that I think are quite often overlooked are the viewfinder of a camera and its overall ergonomics and control layout. There are a lot of older cameras that functionally are fine, but they're not the nicest to hold or interact with. Certain cameras will have different light meter readout types, which is largely preferential, but I personally prefer an LED readout as I find that it provides the best visibility in all lighting conditions. Some cameras will have various shooting modes like aperture priority, shutter priority, and full auto program mode. And while I do the majority of my shooting in manual mode, there are instances in which the speed and efficiency of an auto mode are desirable. If you have absolutely no idea what kind of shooting you want to do, I would say start out with an SLR. They're basically just the most versatile type of camera, and there's really no style of shooting that you can't do with one. However, unlike a point and shoot, if you get an SLR, you're going to need to get a lens for it too. I would recommend starting out with a 50 millimeter lens due to the low cost, widespread availability, and moderate focal length. I've also yet to encounter a 50 millimeter prime from any of the major manufacturers that provided bad image quality, but depending on what kind of shooting you want to do, you may need something else. If you decide to go with a different focal length, anything from 35 to 55 millimeters will be the most versatile and allow you some experimentation with different shooting styles. Anything outside of this range is going to be a little bit more specialized and harder to use outside of its usual purpose. Although, who knows, maybe you'll start the next TikTok trend. As far as pricing goes, you're generally going to spend more money the further you deviate from 50 millimeters, with the price tapering off at anything beyond 85 millimeters on the telephoto end. Now, everybody's always recommending that wet blanket of a camera, the Pentax K1000, and it's not a bad camera, it's just a bad value, and so is the Canon AE-1. The Canon FTB Konica Auto Reflex T4, Yashica FX3, Minolta SRT 101, and the Minolta XGM are all much better value for money cameras, but those are just a few examples. There are many great overlooked options out there. 
Branching off of manual focus SLRs, we have autofocus SLRs. Around the mid to late 80s, manufacturers started to take all the fun out of photography by adding autofocus motors to their camera bodies and removing all the cool stim features like manual knobs and advanced levers. As a result, most modern day analog photographers have been turned off by these late model workhorses. Things like matrix metering, auto bracketing, and multi-point autofocus are just a few examples of the really great modern features that you can find on these cameras. Not to mention the fact that they can be obtained really affordably for what you're getting. If a point and shoot camera is the worst value in analog photography, then the autofocus SLR would probably be the best. If you decide to go with Nikon, Canon, or Pentax, you'll probably end up spending a little bit more money on your lenses as you're gonna be competing with the digital heathens. But I guess this is kind of true of any vintage lens nowadays. On the ultra budget side of things, we have the Minolta HTSI Plus, Pentax MZ5, or the Nikon N8008. The great thing about these options is that they can all still use the best lenses for their respective systems. So you can always decide to upgrade to the juiced out hardcore pro gear later on. Okay, so next up we have range finders, and this is arguably the most difficult category to start out in, not due to usability, but availability. Depending on the model of the camera, the range finder can be coupled or uncoupled, the latter of which will have two windows, one for focusing and the other for composing your image. This means that unlike an SLR, your field of view is not going to change when you switch lenses, and instead you have to rely on the rangefinder's frame lines, which indicate the boundaries of the frame for specific focal lengths. The problem is that most interchangeable lens rangefinders only have frame lines for two or three set focal lengths, and sometimes only one. For everything else, you'll need to use an external shoe-mounted viewfinder, which essentially just turns the rangefinder into an uncoupled rangefinder. This isn't necessarily a big deal if you plan on sticking to a single focal length, but it's not as great where versatility is required. The main benefit of shooting with a rangefinder over an SLR is that they tend to be more compact and quieter because they don't have a mirror box. This makes them the preferred choice for street photographers since it's a lot easier to take creeper pics of someone on the sidewalk without them knowing. Unfortunately to all you would-be street photographers, there aren't nearly as many great affordable options in this category, especially when it comes to interchangeable lenses. Most of the older, less expensive cameras are quite feature limited and everything else is relatively unaffordable. You could always go with one of the fixed lens options, but those tend to have leaf shutters in them, which are a lot less forgiving when they've sat unserviced for many years. Now you're probably thinking, he's got some hidden recommendations up his sleeve that he's gonna share with all of us. And I don't, so basically, good luck. All right, well that brings us to toy cameras, and this is basically gonna cover anything that is uh, fun and gimmicky and really only has one specific use. A few examples are the Nishika N8000 and Rito 3D, which famously take multiple photos simultaneously for creating GIFs. Just kidding, they create GIFs. You thought I was one of those weird people that says GIFs. There are also cameras that waste two thirds of a 35 millimeter frame by cropping the image to a one by three panorama. And of course, Lomography makes a lot of uh, different types of things in this category, some zany options. There's really no shortage of plastic waste that was and continues to be manufactured to this day. Now you may have seen these pseudo disposable style cameras basically everywhere because they've become increasingly abundant over the last few years. They're essentially just e-waste with a fixed lens, fixed focus, fixed shutter speed. It's just fixed everything. The only real way to get consistent exposures out of them is to use the flash, assuming the camera has one. While I understand that they're not really designed with consistency in mind, I think that more than 9 out of 10 times, you're just going to be better off buying a cheap used point-and-shoot camera, which 
also happens to be the more environmentally friendly option. In the world of analog photography, which is inherently not environmentally friendly. The only real upside to these is the convenience factor of being able to walk into like a Walmart to buy one. There's not much else to say here other than a lot of the cameras in the toy camera category are pretty overpriced for what they are. And while I think that they can act as a good gateway drug to the world of analog photography, in general, you're just gonna be better off buying a cheap point and shoot camera. So now that you have a general understanding of what your options are, the first thing you should do is not buy anything. Instead, call up your grandma, not because you're checking in on her, but because you wanna know if she's got any old film cameras collecting dust in her attic. And while you're at it, call everyone else you know and ask them the same thing. Odds are you know someone who has an old camera that they're willing to give to you. And hey, if you're lucky like me and someone had good taste in camera equipment, you could end up with some pretty nice gear. For the rest of you poor souls, not to fear. I'll walk you through some buying options. So you got three main options when it comes to buying cameras. Local, online retailers, online marketplaces. Check local first, but depending on where you live, it could be amazing deals, could be terrible deals. It really all depends on how popular analog photography is in your area. For online marketplaces, you got uh, eBay, Mercari, which seems to have okay deals. I sold there, never purchased from there. There's like Etsy and whatever else, Depop, whatever. You're gonna get cornholed if you buy from one of those, but hey, it doesn't hurt to check to see what's around. So things that you need to understand about eBay are the condition. So the long and short of it is this, used condition, if it doesn't work, you can return it. For parts are not working, you're on the hook. So if it shows up and it's not working, like it says in the listing, then it is what it is, you're stuck with it. Unless it's not as described, that's kind of like the one edge case. Like if they say, oh, it's, uh, you know, it's for parts and they show you a picture of a camera that isn't you know, missing anything, and then they send you a camera that's missing the rewind knob, well then you can return it if it's as is. Okay, so that's what you need to know about eBay. All right, so let's uh, get into a listing here, and I'll show you some things to look out for. So this right here, this is what you gotta look out for, especially on electromechanical SLRs. This should be in its resting position, which is over here. And usually when it's like this, where it's like half over or like all the way over, that usually means that there's some kind of electronic fault. Normally it's the capacitor or one of the capacitors or multiple capacitors. You don't really know. The other thing is the mirror, it's not fully up, it's not fully down. Mirror should be down. This thing should be in the correct resting position. It's called the aperture lever. And um, yeah, neither of those things are true. So this definitely has some kind of either electrical issue or it's jammed or something. So don't buy that. And then obviously look at the rest of the camera and see like, is it missing parts? Look closely because sometimes it can be hard to tell, especially if the pictures suck, which is pretty common. So here's an example of one where they show the shutter curtain. The shutter curtain looks good. The mirror is down. The aperture lever is in the correct resting position. Mirror looks pretty clean. It's of course, it's very hard to tell, but it looks fine uh, the outside is grungy but odds are this thing is gonna work when you get it it says untested once again but it also does say condition used you could probably be that guy if it showed up and it didn't work this isn't a terrible deal there are better deals to be had but but anyway the point is those are the main things to look out for sometimes what you'll find is that the lens attached to the camera is worth more than the camera and this this isn't that uncommon um this one has a 1.4. So here's, he, this is actually a good example. So this has a 50 millimeter 1.4. This lens like kind of okay condition usually sells around 60 bucks. So this whole thing is 70. However you want to do the mental gymnastics, you call it 35 for the, the 35 for the lens, 35 for the camera body. That's not a bad deal for this camera with the 50 millimeter f1.4. If you have to have the 50 millimeter f1.4, that's a whole separate topic for discussion, but that's just something that I wanted to point out to you. 
like the cheapest ones we're seeing are over $70 without the camera. So, I mean, even if you're taking a chance on the camera, you're getting the lens for what you would have paid anyway. Other thing to mention with eBay, check the seller's seller rating. It should be 100% positive, but if they've sold like thousands of items, if it's 99%, that's acceptable as well. Anything lower than that, really, I would just be very careful because usually that indicates that more than just like one or two outliers have had bad experiences with the seller. So just, you know, watch out for that. A few points on point and shoot cameras that I should have mentioned earlier, but I forgot. So cut me a little slack here, okay? Uh, avoid anything that isn't like name brand. So avoid Kodak, avoid like capital MX, okay? Like that's not a thing, that's not a brand. Vivitar, I don't have enough experience with. I would lean towards no. So yeah, avoid the, the focus free cameras, avoid non name brand point and shoots, avoid APS cameras. So you might get tricked into thinking that you found a good deal on something. If it's an APS camera, avoid it. I'll, I'll flash it on screen now so you can see the symbol for APS. Don't buy an APS camera. So this is a good example of a good deal on a point and shoot. So it's name brand, it's $19 free shipping, so it's less than 30 bucks. It is a zoom lens, but it's probably gonna be pretty good. It doesn't look like it's broken. It takes a lithium battery, so it's unlikely that there's gonna be any issues with um, corrosion. There might be oxidation, but no like heavy corrosion. The latch looks good. It has the auto DX coating. It looks pretty clean. Rear element looks good. And then the, uh, the seller says that it's power tested. 99% of the time with these point and shoot cameras, if they power on and the shutter will fire, they work. Let me see if I can find another deal. All right, here's one. Boom. Canon Sure Shot Joy. This is like the same as the Canon that I use. 35 at 4.5, It's it like literally is the same camera. It takes a weird battery, but you can still order them online and they last a long time. Notably, this has a screw, like a screw in battery compartment. That's actually a good thing because the hinged battery compartments are prone to breaking. So anything that is less likely to break is a plus. This one checks all the boxes too. Canon, it's a name brand. It's $13, free shipping, 100% positive feedback. It's fixed lens. It's not focus free. It has a DX, you know, like a DX code reading thing, so you're not going to be, presumably you won't be limited in ISO. Uh, the lens looks good, it's not broken, that's uh, I would say green light on this. I'll have a link in the description, uh, it'll be an affiliate link for eBay, so if you decide to buy any gear through eBay, when you go through that link, they should give me some kind of kickback, it won't cost you anything, but it helps me out, so I would appreciate it. KEH, on the other hand, did not give me an affiliate link, but we're not gonna let spite get in the way of pointing you all in the direction of a good deal. So, the thing about KEH and other larger online retailers, KEH use Proto Pro. I think even, if I'm not mistaken, I think MPB also sells vintage lenses. The thing about these websites is that you're really paying for the warranty and like the, the return policy that's, um, attached to the purchase so any of like the mainstream models of cameras and stuff are going to be marked up but it's not really that cost efficient for these sites to process and test all of the like under the radar cameras so you can really find some good deals when it comes to like the less sought after gear so with keh as is you can't return it and it's not covered under the warranty ugly is not covered under the warranty but you can return it which is important and then everything else is covered and you can return so what i like to do is every so often i'll come to uh keh or whatever other site it is and i will just go to the film camera section and I'll sort by uh, price ascending and see what they have because they get new inventory in, you know, regularly. So you just, you just come back, keep checking regularly. And there have been some like really good deals, like surprisingly good deals. So this is a great example. 
it's an it's a Minolta XGM for eight bucks. I mean, it's basically an X570. Even if you bought two of them and they both didn't work, sixteen dollars. You know, it's not an inconsequential amount of money for some people, myself included. You could buy an untested one on eBay for thirty, or you could buy an untested or as is one for eight bucks here on KEH and you know that way you're out eight dollars versus 30 if you're going to take the gamble all right let's see what else there is so Konica auto reflex t this is like you know this is Konica's srt 101 pendax k1000 you know same vibe with this uh with this camera here it's nine bucks it's gonna be the same story nine dollars as is srt 200 15 bucks srt 100 16 auto reflex t3 17 there's actually not as much right now as i'm recording this than there was last time uh, i was on here trying to record this and, and buying stuff but the point is check back regularly and uh there's you know there are deals to be had all right, but now let's say you wanted to get a lens for your Minolta XGM, your $8 Minolta XGM at that. So 50 millimeter, 1.7, 15 bucks. You could get the 50 F2. You could get the later version, ugly, 20 bucks. Here's another one, ugly, two of them for $16, 51.7. So for $24, you could have a full kit. Obviously, you're going to have to factor in shipping, which I believe is about $10. So, you know, 34 bucks. But even after tax, you're under the $50 price point that I had mentioned earlier. So it's pretty hard to beat for a solid kit. Now, as of the time I'm recording this segment of the video, I do have a little bit more experience with KEH and the ugly can be hit or miss, but the fact that you can return it is a pretty big deal in terms of, you know, getting something that you're ultimately happy with. So really the key takeaway is just look everywhere you can. And if you are willing to buy, you know, if you're not married to one specific camera and or lens, you can really get some good deals on stuff. Even still in 2024, there are still many good deals to be had. Just in case you uh, still somehow think that I'm talking out of my ass, I bought not one, but three different kits to test out and show you. We're gonna see if we can actually get gear fully working for under 50 bucks, or at least around $50, okay? Yeah, let's do that. All right, so we got a Yashica FX3, okay, and then we got Minolta XGM. Okay, there's the Yashica ML50 1.9. And then this last one, I actually didn't buy this for this video. I bought it because I actually need this, but it happens to uh, play double duty because it's a Minolta SR mount lens. Okay. And then this is a Minolta 50 millimeter F 3.5 macro. Um, all the stuff that I bought from KEH is uh, in as is condition, except for one of the lenses, which is bargain grade. It's really hard to tell with lenses uh, until you shine a bright light through them, just like how clean they are. But if you look through it uh, in decent lighting, you can usually see whether or not there's like fungus in there. A little bit of dust. I mean, I've never encountered a lens that didn't have at least a little bit of dust in it. And most of the time, unless it's like really egregious, it's not gonna affect your image quality in a noticeable way. So the only issue with this lens, at least in my opinion, is the focus throw is a little bit stiff. It's not the worst that I've ever encountered, uh, but the aperture ring is very nice. Okay, next up, the camera. So the, yeah, the leatherette is like completely gone, but that's not that big of a deal. You can always recover cameras and a lot of the time you can make them feel significantly nicer when you do that as well. Yeah, so that's, I mean, 
All of the speeds work and they all are reasonably accurate. Like this is totally usable. So that is pretty awesome. And then bold. So let's open it up. It, I guarantee you all these cameras are gonna need light seals, yep. Yeah, I mean, all in all though, it's pretty clean. I don't know if uh, if they clean the the as is or the bargain grade gear or whatever, but let's see if this works. Yeah. All right, I'm not sure where I was, but my camera decided to give up on recording. Uh, I think I was testing out the meter for this, which does work, by the way. So, yeah, everything works. Mechanically, electronically. Yeah, it's a little shitted up, but for 40 bucks, uh, I would say that this is a slam dunk smash hit. All right, next up, we got the old Minolta XGM, AKA the Sleeper X570. Right off the bat, this one's a lot grimier than the last. The question is, does it work? This one was also a bargain, or uh, as is grade. Um, let's open it up. Once again, guarantee the light seals are fucked. Uh, yep, they sure are. Shutter curtain looks good though. As you can see, they let this one crust over. I mean, it's not physically, br oh, oh, we've encountered a problem. It would appear that the on-off switch is horribly jammed. What the, f what the flip? Yeah, that's, uh, that's gonna be an issue. The question is, can I get it unstuck? All right, so in order to tackle this major malfunction, I don't wanna use anything that the average newcomer would not have, so. I'm just gonna take some isopropyl alcohol and a Q-tip, which I would hope that everyone would have access to a basic hygiene product and a household cleaning agent. We're gonna just run some of this along here, try and loosen up whatever the f is holding this cemented in place. Oh, did we get it? Yeah, baby. Ew, <laughs> it's just turning brown, <laughs> which is, I mean, it's not unusual for a camera of this age. I'm just gonna work this back and forth until it really frees up. Oh yeah, there we go. All right, let's pop some batteries in this bad boy. Oops. Gotta show it on camera or else people are gonna say it was faked. Does it work? Oh, it works. I mean the shutter. Wowie zowie. It's alive. I'm not gonna go through every speed, but Ooh, yeah. Speeds seem pretty good too. Yep, the meter works. All right, let's throw the uh, let's throw the lens on here. I didn't even have to clean the um, battery tray, which is shocking, because that's a pretty common thing on these uh, Minolta X series cameras. Okay, so here's the macro lens, which once again looks pretty damn good. I don't see any fungus. There's just like no haze. I don't even really see any. Oh, I, okay, never mind. Wait, hang on. Yeah, so it, it's a little hazy. Um, it's not great. And I think the real reason why it's not, why it's a uh, bargain grade here, or a uh, as is grade, is because uh, it's missing its bearing to give it the click stops. Theoretically, it should still work. I don't know if it's actually missing it or if um, it's just out of position under here or whatever, but it's not something that the average person would 
tackle themselves anyway, so. But the focus is relatively smooth. Oh, uh, yeah, there's definitely something wrong back here. I mean, for me, it's not really an issue because I'm gonna take it apart and clean it anyway, but yeah. If you were uh, trying to buy a lens in as is condition, uh, maybe don't, I don't know. It's a really small sample size, but I would be more inclined to take the risk on the camera body, especially when it's like six, five or six dollars rather than the lens. Well, let's try it anyway, let's see. Oh, there's a screw loose on the, on the lens near the aperture ring, which might explain the situation. I don't feel like pulling out a screwdriver, which would be the correct tool for the job. Oh, we've had a breakthrough once again. Yeah, it's a little stiff for some reason at the, um, at the automatic setting, like the program mode setting. So F22, it's a little bit stiff, but you're pretty much never gonna be shooting it at F22. So who cares? Hey, not bad. This was uh, not that cheap actually. However, if I were gonna do this as like a walk around, like I bought this lens to uh, scan film. If I were gonna use it to actually like walk around and shoot with, although you could with a with a macro lens like this, it's just like the focus throw would be kind of annoying. I would get the uh, 50 millimeter F2, F1.7, or like the F1.4 if you could find a good deal on it. All right, let's move on to the eBay stuff now. Okay, we have a Konica Auto Reflex T4. And this is in pretty rough shape. The shutter speed dial moves just fine. Looks really dirty, let me see. Oh yeah, viewfinder is absolutely loaded with crust. Um, and this is kind of how I find it goes with eBay. They show up a lot dirtier than if you buy them from like, uh, you know, some other online retailer. That's kind of the nature of the game with eBay. People typically don't put too much effort into cleaning stuff before they pass it on. So the back shutter looks good. The inside's actually really clean. Obviously the light seals are completely shot. Shutter seems to work. Let's see if the... Uh... So yeah, self-timer also works. Let's throw some batteries in this and see if the meter works. A lot of cameras like, uh, like the Canon FTB have built-in voltage regulators. And by that, I mean they have resistors to regulate the voltage. So even though a lot of the old Mercury batteries were 1.3 volts and LR44s and SR44s are 1.5 volts, most of the time they still work. So we'll see if that's the case here. Let's get the lens on here. We got the plastic bag padding here. I think this came from California, so that's surprising. All right, so for the lens for this one, I bought a Konica Hexanon AR 50 millimeter F1.7. It's in pretty good shape. It's not amazing, actually. There's no fungus in it or anything. It looks like there's some cleaning marks on the lens coating probably some rough cleaning over the years. And same goes on the rear element. It just needs to be wiped down a little bit better. Uh, but for the most part, that's not gonna be an issue. Focus throw feels good. And the aperture ring also feels good. This is a pretty solidly built lens too. It's mostly metal. Does work. Frame counter also works. Frame counter actually is something I forgot to show, but it works on all three of the cameras as well. 
All right, so there you have it, guys. Three working cameras, three working lenses, two from online retailer, one from eBay. Both are viable avenues to pick up your first piece of gear or just a new piece of gear. Obviously, I wouldn't go for this lens. I'd probably pick up something like this 50 millimeter F2 or a 1.7. You'll spend less and you will be more likely to get a better condition lens as well. So that's that. Well, that was quite a lot to take in. It's okay if you need to watch the video 10 more times. This is really just the first step on the journey that is analog photography. You still actually have to learn how to use your camera, something I'm still working on all these years later. Who knows, maybe there will be a follow-up to this video someday. You'll just have to subscribe to find out. As always, if you liked the video, share it with your friends. And if you didn't like the video, well, I guess you're just gonna have to share it with your enemies. Anyway, until next time, peace.